Hi guys, we're back after intermission. We had a great intermission time. Everybody went for popcorn and, and Cracker Jacks. We're back with uh, the fantastic, the wonderful, the Renaissance woman, Maria Brofet. <laughs> you know, there's one thing I, I, I just want to talk about on the sidebars. Like, well, two, I have two questions, but one, I'll deal with the easy one first. What about all that traveling you do around the world, like a globe trotter? Tell me about that. How do you guys do that? It was a plan. It was a plan thing. We said many years ago, when we started working together, when I finally quit that corporate job, we said, we're going to create, we're going to create our business and arrange it so that we can travel wherever we want to go, whenever we want to go. And I remember when I quit my job and Drew said, this is awesome. Let's go to Australia for a month and we'll drive around in a van. And I still was in that like conservative mode. And I said, well, God, I just quit my job. And we, we got to figure out how to replace the income. And, and we got to like figure out how we're going to get money coming in. And I, I, we can't do that yet. And he said, Maria, this is the life we just created. We're going to Australia. We're not waiting. I was like, oh yeah, you're right. You're right. That's why I quit my job. So, I mean, immediately we went to Australia and I, I learned to get really creative with finding work everywhere we go. And so when we got to Australia, we rented a van and um, we went to surf shops and we got commissioned work for Drew to paint surfboards and other things. And what happened while we were there is people started giving us places to stay. Oh, okay. He, a guy named Mark Richards, who is the most famous surfer in Australia. Yeah, I've heard of Mark Richards. <laughs> he's won, I don't even know how many world titles, I eight, 10, I don't know, a lot of world titles. Um, he was, he's a generation before Kelly Slater. So he's probably, I don't know, in his 50s. But um, we got connected with him and he hired Drew to do some work for him while we were there. And then he said, hey, if you guys are heading south down the coast, I have a little beach house in Angari and I'll give you the keys and you can have it for a week or two. So these things kept happening to us the whole time we were in Australia. We got paying jobs and people gave us houses to stay in at the beach, at different beach towns. And, um, we said, wow, this, this is cool. Like when you set the intention right. that this is what you're going to do, then your brain starts looking for solutions and it happens. So, um, yeah, we just turn every trip we do into a business trip. We did the same thing in New Zealand and we've done it in Europe. And um, in two days, we're going to South Carolina and that's where Drew's from at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and we're going there to spend time with family, but we have a lot of business things lined up for when we're there. So, um, yeah, we just managed to... So, have, have you, have you, how many trips have you made outside the, outside the states? You've been to the Far East and stuff like that? Um, let's see, gosh. Well, I, Drew and I have done a lot of trips together, and we've done a lot of trips separately. So, yeah, I've been to um, Thailand and Bali and um, Fiji, New Zealand, all over Europe. Oh, I'm so boring. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Costa Rica. <laughs> oh, Costa Rica. Okay, me gusta, me gusta. Okay. Um, Drew's been a lot more places than I have, actually. He's been to Brazil and... Um, Peru and he's he just went to Croatia a month ago and actually um, he went on this cruise with a bunch of scientists and physicists and, and archaeologists and they uh, did um, it was like a I want to say it was about a 10 or 12 day cruise and they went to Bosnia and they explored the Bosnian one of the Bosnian pyramids and so it was a very, there was no surfing because there's no surf out there. Right. Um, but um, it was, it was all the ancient uh, culture stuff that Drew likes to do. Wow. It was studying for the next big series that he's going to paint. Oh, that's nice. He's doing uh, 
He's doing field research. Exactly. So it is a business write-off. Of course, it's, it, it, you know, you figured that out. So, so now, what, once you're back in the States, back in San Clemente, right, here's a very personal question. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, but who, okay. does, the, who does the cooking in your house? Um, it's pretty much 50-50. Yeah? And what, what's your favorite dish? What do you, what do you cook? <laughs> well, I, I like vegetables. <laughs> okay. I like big salads and um, creative dishes. <laughs> when it comes, you know, like really healthy stuff, I'm all about the health. And then, and Drew loves his meat. So oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to stay away from meat a little bit, but um, yeah. I feel sorry for Drew because our daughter's a vegetarian and I recently have given up meat 90% and it's making him crazy. <laughs> yes, it, it, it can do that with one's partner does that stuff, I understand. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I don't know who this woman is. When I married her, she loved steak. Now she's eating, you know, right. you you, know veggies. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a rather food person now, right? Yeah. I, but you know what? It gives me a lot more energy. I just, I, I felt like my energy really went down the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, I, I had the same experience. When I, used, I was just eating a lot of meats, and then I went to the, to the vegetables. It felt better. But that was way back in my Cali days, you know, way a long time ago. So let's move on to another image we have here. Oh, this, this, now tell me, this must be a, a fake photograph. Because... <laughs> I just took that last week that's down the street from my house. Oh, oh and wow. that is my town. I love it. My God, look at that. Is that, we is that complain, a plane? You know, it's, like, we, we complain about how expensive it is to live here. And then we walk down the street and we see this and we go, that's why we live in that's right. a tiny, 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 tiny house. So we can have this giant backyard of water. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's beautiful. And I remember you, there was a post you said, when things aren't going your way, you just go outside and look at what you got, right? I got to remind myself of, okay, look, I've got this. Yes, that's true. We, we forget go, sometimes. We do, we do, we do forget. We do forget. And cruising right along, here, we are, here you are against the wall. So that was... That was a few weeks ago. That was in Venice Beach, California. Yes. And we were there. We were actually in Venice Beach because Drew was doing a project for Land Rover, completely unrelated to this wall. But I was out walking around the streets, and I saw this wall, and I said, oh, my God, it's the 10,000 Buddha wall, which okay. I know this woman's work. And, um, oh, my gosh, what's her first name? Uh, I'm all high on um, cappuccino right now, so her name's escaping me. But um, this is an artist who I've been following, so this is really cool what she's doing. She has made it her quest to paint 10,000 Buddhas, and she's doing it one wall at a time. And this is a wall I found in Venice Beach. She's been flying all over the country and doing a little bit overseas painting these Buddha walls, and she's also painting Buddha, uh, this uh, similar thing on canvas and wood. Oh, I see, okay. And they, um, does she get some type of sponsorship for that? I don't know if she has a sponsorship, but I'll tell you what, she has gathered a giant following. And this is one thing I always tell artists, come up with something that's important to you and make a campaign out of it. And I use that word campaign because people tend to understand that better than anything else. And what this woman is doing is a perfect example. It's a, it's a natural organic campaign. When she came up with this idea, she actually spent some time in India and that's when she, she came up with this idea when she was doing some spiritual inner work in India and she was inspired by some of the things she saw there and she decided she was going to spread some of this love and feeling of joy and peace Powerful. and create 10,000 Buddhas and so she came back to the States and started doing it 
And now there are, I don't know how many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people following what she's doing. Wow. And, and, and how, how many Buddhas is this that she have in this wall, you know? I think on that particular wall, there's like one or maybe 150. It's a, it's a much bigger wall than what you see in the photo. Okay. I think, um, I think she's, up, last I read, she was up to about, I, I want to say 5,000 Buddhas. Oh, okay, good. And, um, and you know, the, the ironic or the kind of funny thing about this is I had been following her work and it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago when I looked her up online and read about her um, on her website that I realized I've met her before. Oh, okay. Her husband is a musician named MC Yogi, and I've been to a lot of his oh, concerts. I've heard of MC Yogi. He danced on his stage. Right. She was there, and I never realized that that was the same person who was this artist until I ended up on her website. Right, right, right. So if you want to know more about her work, just do a Google search of 10,000 Buddhas, and okay. you'll, you'll find it. So, so, so not only is this an interesting piece is it like a uh, global piece global consciousness but you've just shared some very interesting marketing information yeah all right like when you when you decide to do something like another artist i can think of was wyland back in the 70s wyland is a very incredibly successful artist out of laguna beach california he actually grew up in the Midwest, came out to California when he was a teenager, fell in love with the ocean, found out that whales were in trouble, you know, uh, they were being hunted and he cared about whales and he started painting and decided he wanted to be a professional artist. So he got this idea to paint a giant whale on a giant wall. <laughs> And it took him three years to get the city approval to paint this. It, he almost gave up oh. numerous times. But finally, he was able to paint this giant whale on this wall in Laguna Beach. And when he did, and it was just one wall, this is, I don't know how, many, how big this whale was, but it's like this on the side of a giant building. And a reporter was doing a story on him. And the reporter said, Wyland, what's next after this? <laughs> and Wyland thought for a second and just off the top of his head he said I'm going to paint a hundred of these whoa and he did hmm. I think it took him 30 years maybe 25 years wow he did a hundred and, the, and the, the very last one that he painted was at one of the the last Olympics in China I think it was yeah that was what, eight years ago yeah so um but that's a that's a great example of somebody who was moved to do something with his art for something that was important to him and for him right it was he felt that if he painted a giant whale sized whale painting on a wall it would get enough attention from people that some people might start to care about whales Right. So in other words, he, he came from a position of passion. His passions were drove it, but because it came from the heart, it was successful. And he was consistent. He yeah. kept at it. And success did not come two years later or five years later. I think it was 10 years. I don't know exactly how many years, but it was a long time after that before he could say he was truly successful. It, as in, he had a number of galleries that he owns. And he makes, you know, in the hundreds of millions. Well, I think it was like eight years ago, I read in a magazine, he did a hundred million that year in art licensing alone. So I would say he's pretty successful. So speaking of that, what, you know, an artist makes X amount of money. Say he's making $200,000 a year, which is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. How do you, how do you? But it's not. Excuse me? It is, but it's not, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, how do you get, uh, what's, what's your position on passive income? Well, I think passive income is crucial if you want to be wealthy. I just recently read that 
wealthy people have, I think it said nine streams of income. Nine streams of income. So you're never gonna get wealthy having a job, just alone, right? Um, and, the, and the point of, of that, what I, that article that I read was, it, it takes people years to line up all these different streams of income. So passive income is one, and, and there are a lot of different ways to get passive income. Write a book, write a lot of books, because you never get rich off of one book unless, right, right. unless you wrote Fifty Shades of Grey or Harry Potter books. Yes, right. Um, but if you write a lot of books, your average person can get a good residual income coming. And art licensing is a great example of making money where, you know, you could say you're making money in your sleep, but I have to say, it's not that easy. Could you, could you take us down that? Take, <laughs> how does that work out? Could you give, take us through the steps? To be able, all right, well, first of all, let me talk about what licensing your art is. It means that you take an art piece um, and you <clears throat> fill a need of a manufacturer. Let's say a manufacturer makes beach towels and they make these beautiful plush beach towels, but they want to make the beach towels appeal to, let's say, people who love yoga. Okay. So they're going to look for yoga art and uh, or yoga inspired art or art that yogis would love and if you're an artist that that's what you do they might say hey we want to license your art we're going to pay you five percent of our sales how do i how do I, how do I how do i identify these guys how do i get there so that's where a lot of work comes in because here's the thing first the art has to come right um this is where it's really important to have a large body of work. And sometimes they will find you. So I would say most of our licensees for Drew's surf art has found us. Um, and it's because Drew has decades of art. <laughs> and um, his decades of art behind him, um, when you do a Google search of surf art, hundreds of his images pop up. So if somebody's looking for that, they're going to find him and they're going to say, whoa, look at all this stuff this guy did. We're going to contact him. Right. Um, so it's really important to have a large body of work in your particular theme, in your particular style. And... Um, then you'll attract the people that are looking for what you do. If you're an artist that does a hundred different things, hundred different styles, a hundred different themes, it's going to be a lot harder for you to license your work. Right, because because it's different stuff. Yeah. So let's say you do have in this huge portfolio. I don't have one. Sorry. Sorry. I'm being interrupted by my artist. <laughs> He's looking for a plug. Um, so, okay. So let's say you've never gotten into licensing before. You've been creating art for a long time and um, you do have a huge portfolio of a particular theme. Let's, let's use the example of horses. And you say, you know, I think my art would actually look great on products like horse blankets and art prints that are marketed to people who love horses. And um, I, there's so many different products in that market that you could license your art for. So you would look for manufacturers that are making those products and you would send an introductory letter about your art with links to where you're, they can look at your art online. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's like getting into a gallery. You have to send out a hundred emails and make a hundred phone calls to get 10 people interested. Why, why, why is that? I mean, the gallery guy should be looking for good stuff. <laughs> the reason is because there's a ton of people out there 
there's, there's hundreds of thousands of artists and there's only a small number of galleries and there's a small number of manufacturers selling and making horse products. I got you. So, so it's, it's like, there's a few people who do it and a lot of people who want to do it. Yeah. So, so you're, you're, what you're saying is you have to be persistent, have a plan and, and just stay with it. Yeah. So that's why I always say that, you know, having a niche is important and I get pushback on that from people. And I understand, you know, one thing a lot of artists will say to me is, but I love doing flowers one week and painting sea life the next week. And I love experimenting with oils this month and next month watercolors. And I don't want to be stifled by, you know, having to, to pick one thing. And I say, that's okay, you can experiment with all these things, but if you wanna make money, if you wanna earn a living, you really have to choose one thing to focus on, and you can do all the other stuff for fun, but focus on the one niche so that you can sell it and market it effectively. How does that, how does that what you just said, how does that tie into things that can go for an artist and things that go against an artist. And you have three things that go against an artist you're doing wrong. Is that one of them? Well, yeah. So let's say I'm looking for, let's say I'm a buyer, right? Let's say I'm an interior designer. Okay. And I'm looking for a particular kind of piece. I'm looking for a painting that looks like water, that looks like a waterfall. Okay. And let's say you're an artist and you have a couple of those paintings, but you also have 50 other unrelated themes. And so me as the buyer, I'm gonna do a Google search or I'm gonna ask for a recommendation from people who know. Right. They're not gonna recommend the artist that's dabbling in this and dabbling in that. They're gonna recommend the artist that specializes in the waterfall painting. Right. This, this guy does waterfalls, get him. Yeah, or the Google search is gonna take them. Let's say the Google search does take them to your website and you've got a hundred different unrelated themes on your website. And they're gonna find one water style painting, a waterfall style painting on your website. And they're gonna go, well, that's really pretty, but it looks like this isn't really what they do. Next, and they're gonna look for an artist that does that mostly or that specializes in it that kind of makes sense that kind of makes sense yeah it's just like you know i don't go shoe shopping in a boutique store where it's mostly clothing and a little bit of shoes if i'm looking for shoes i'm going to go to a shoe store right right you're going to get you have a wider choice yeah and it and i mean maybe that's not a perfect analogy but um if I'm gonna spend money on something, or, or another great example, if I'm gonna hire a, a web designer to redo a web page for me, I'm not gonna to go to a graphic artist that does a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm gonna to go to a web designer that, where that's all they do, because then I know that they really know what they're doing. Exactly. And what they're known for. He's a specialist, specialist. All right, let's move along with some other images we have here. Oh my God, what is that? <laughs> that is something we just did. Uh, I said, when I say we, I mean Drew. Um, that's a project we just did a couple weeks ago and it actually was a several month long project. So the client wanted a sacred geometry painting painted on a 10 foot by 10 foot round soffit on his ceiling however, however the ceiling soffit was already installed and drew did not want to paint this upside down laying on his back of course, of course. so he said how about i paint it on a giant canvas and then we install the canvas on top of the soffit so to uh, so that's our studio that's a photo of our studio and like i said it's about 1100 square feet inside and we have four separate rooms. And so Drew had to actually build a separate, he had to build a special table to paint this on. 
Yes. Because we don't have one room big enough to lay this whole thing out. So we had to paint it in sections. Wow. And then after it was painted, we took it outside um, to be photographed by our photographer. So our photographer, which you can't see from this photo, is parked, out, sta parked outside, parked across on the curb, standing in the, in the bed of his pickup truck taking this photo. Uh, not this particular photo. I actually took this photo with my iPhone. But what he was doing was getting a high-res scan with his, his good camera so that we could make art prints of it. And um, you can't see it in this photo, but there's actually two guys standing behind it up on the balcony making sure that it's not falling down. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> you, you can kind of see their fingers a yes, little bit. Yes, I, yes, I see that. I see that. But I, that here's a question I, for you. Now, who installed this piece? Who, who, who installed well, it? Well, I didn't want us to have to do it, but Drew insisted that he be involved. So it was Drew and four guys that were hired by the client. Um, the five of them, it took them four ladders <laughs> and about five hours to install it on the ceiling. Wow. Which I should have sent you a photo of it installed, but... I don't have a really good photo of it yet. I need to send a photographer out there. Because, because, because the installation would really be, that's a, that's a challenge with a piece like that, that size. Oh my God. It was a crazy challenge. I was a nervous wreck just thinking, how in the heck are they doing this? They had to, oh my gosh. It was, it was nerve wracking, but they did it. It, it worked. Yeah. It looks beautiful. It's in a place called the Awakenings um, Conf Conference, Conference Center. It's okay. in Miguel, California. Wow, cool, man. And there's another image of this piece, not so large, but this is how it looks. Like, I guess. You know, it's a metal print. Oh, that's so a, print. We, a metal print. We, we printed it on metal already. And, and the owner of Awakenings actually had us printed out on a 40 inch by 40 inch metal so that he could hang that in his personal home. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> well, now, now, now tell me about this metal stuff. I mean, I've heard a lot about this stuff. And by the way, the gentleman I worked with last week, Eric Amusic, he's doing a series of 40 metal panels as well. Seems to oh. be, you know, seems to be a new thing happening. How does that work? You, you, you have to emboss it on, you spray it on? It's, it's actually, you know, we don't print them ourselves. We have a printer do it for us, but it's, it's like a sublimation printing on metal. Okay, cool. And yeah, so we just, it's, it's just like having, you know, it works the same way as having a canvas printed. Okay. You know, like it should clay print on canvas. It's very similar to that, except it's on metal. And how, how heavy is that, the metal? It's actually not very heavy. Um, this 40 inch by 40 inch, which is quite large, um, I want to say it only weighs like six or seven pounds. Oh, wow. That's neat, man. And you, Yeah, so I was able to hold it up, pick it up. Yeah. That's, oh, that's thanks. That's good, that's good info. That's good info. I, yeah. You guys out there, check that out. Now, here we go. There we are. It says <laughs> three things that could be holding you back from what you want. Yep. What are those three things? Oh gosh, what did I write? I don't remember. <laughs> it, it says, it says, when I was working in the corporate world 15 years ago, I dreamed of leaving my job to work with my artist husband. Yeah. Uh, Drew, but truth to be told, I was afraid to leave the, and I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> I was afraid to leave the security okay. of the job. Without a doubt, you know how hard it is to leave a very secure job? I tell young artists, artists that are like, you know, 20 years old, you are in the best position ever to start an art business before you get tied down with a house and, and exactly right. kids. Right. Like, this is the time because once you 
get settled in with a mortgage and children and you have this job that's so secure that it's nearly impossible to leave. So I was afraid of leaving the comfort of the money that I knew where it was coming from every month. And I knew how much I was going to make. And, um, and I was afraid I didn't really trust in myself. And, um, what do you mean by that? That you couldn't generate enough money? Yeah, I was, because I don't have a crystal ball and I wasn't raised to know anything about the art business. I mean, I, I, I had a little bit of work under my belt, you know, because I had been helping Drew off for quite a few years before I left the job. But, but still, I was, um, yeah, I was really hesitant. I was just afraid. It's the same thing. You know, everybody is always afraid of the unknown. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We are. So that's, so, so that your, your comments there about basically saying, don't, don't be reluctant to leave security, go for what your dream is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're living proof that, that it can be done. It can be done and you figure it out. You figure, you figure it out or you don't. You either figure it out or you don't, right? Um, well, for those people who have difficulty, they can contact you, right? That's right. And how do they contact you? So they can go to my website, mariabrophy.com. And there's a lot of information on how I work with people. Um, if you go to my work with me page, there's a lot of different ways that you can work with me directly through consulting. You can sign up for a consulting for um, we can either do consulting by email and that's the most economical option or by the hour. And I also just added a monthly and it's sort of like a coaching, but again, it's solving business problems for artists. Right, right. Actually, coaching, I guess, is like you said, is more for the psychological aspect. And I do help with that a little bit, but I really, I. I I, I find a lot of the problems that pe that artists have that I really help with is strategies to deal with clients, whether it's pricing out okay. contracts and so forth. Could you give us an idea what that's like? Hi, Ray, this is Bill Jordan here. I need help with my client. You need help with what? My client, you know, my client's running me crazy. He wants me to, wants me to do everything for free. Oh. He wants extras. What do I do? What, tell me, go stuff it or what? Okay. Well, that's a good one because I hear that sometimes. You really have to set boundaries and you have to realize that you train people how to treat you. So if you have a client that's constantly texting you and they want an answer right now and they're not respecting your time because they're texting you at nine o'clock at night when you're with your family um, or on weekends and it's not an emergency, you have to set boundaries for people. And you do it in a, you, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it, but I'll give you just a few quick things. Always speak and communicate in a positive way. So never say, I'm sorry, I don't take calls after six or on weekends. Instead say, I'm always available for you between the hours of <laughs> nine and six. <laughs> right. Unless I'm in a meeting, and if I'm in a meeting, I'll get back to you. Or if I'm painting, I turn my phone off sometimes so I, don't, so I can stay focused. Um, but if I don't get your call right away, I will return it immediately, you know, as soon as I get your message. But you always frame it in a positive way. If it's someone who is trying to talk you down on price, well, you quoted something at $1,000 and they say, can you do it for 500? That's a huge price difference. Yes. So, number one, don't get mad. Don't get offended, even though it is offensive. I agree. I get offended sometimes, but I never let them know it. I say, well, um, what we could do is lessen the scope of the project. So I quoted you 
this particular item for $1,000. If your budget's 500, what we could do is we could, and you get creative. If they want it, let, let's just say it's a painting. You quoted them $1,000 for an uh, 18 by 24 painting. I'm just making this up as I go, but, um, and they only have a $500. Okay, for $500, I can do an 11 by 14. Mm -hmm. And maybe it won't have as much detail in it. That's so, just one example. Or right. So basically, you're, you're, you're commoditizing the art from the standpoint of making a deal. Yeah. Or, and then if they say, and, and I've had, okay, so I had this happen once where, where this guy wanted Drew to paint these surfboards. He had refurbished these old surfboards and he wanted them to be painted in a certain way from like using a 1970s style airbrush painting from this, the way surfboards were painted in a certain period, time period in a certain artistic way. And he said, to me, I want something that's going to knock people's socks off when they see it. I want it to be reminiscent of that era, and I want it to be collectible. And I gave him a price quote, and he said, oh my gosh, you know, I was only going to pay, you know, I only have a budget for half of that. And, he, and this is by email, right? So I don't email him back. I, I call him. I pick up the phone. Right. And I say, hey, I just want to talk to you about this. And I have my notes, my notebook. And in my notes, I had written down earlier what he had said to me about what he wanted. Stunning, collectible, reminiscent of this era. Right. So I used his own words on the phone. And I said, well, Jeff, you, you said that this is what you want. You want something that's stunning and collectible. To be able to do that, Drew's mm. going to have to put this much time into mm. it. Um, and it's, this is how much it's going to cost for him to block out that much time. Right. We can lessen the time, but it's going to lessen the scope of work. So what we could do is instead of him painting all five of those surfboards, mm -hmm. he could paint three of them or he could paint all five but it's going to be um we're going to have to simplify the process so it won't be exactly what you're looking for but it'll take him less time and you know what the guy said what no i want what i want i'll pay it whoa so now i know now who to call when i need a negotiator <laughs> Well, well, it starts with your first conversation with the client. What do you it, mean by that? What do you mean? Okay, so first of all, I rarely give a price quote by email. When someone emails and says, I want a price on this, I say, I email back and say, let's set up a time for a call so I can make sure I, I know exactly what you need. So I get them on the phone and I will ask them a lot of questions. What is it that, what's the end result? What is the feeling you're trying to get? Like if it's a painting that's going in a house or a business, what's the um, feeling that you want people to have when they walk in the room and they see this piece? And they'll say, dramatic, yet peaceful and soothing. And I write those words down. I write down their words that they say, and I'll say, well, what, I'll ask, well, what's the most important thing to you about this? And they'll say, you know, I mean, for everybody it's different, but they might say, well, it's really important to me that Drew gets the colors right. Because yeah. right. Um, I'm looking for this particular shade of blue with hints of gold. And so I'll write that down. So then after a conversation where I feel like I really understand what they want, then I'll say, okay, now that I have all this, I'm going to put a price quote together and I'll email it to you. And then I put a lot of thought into it. Sometimes I, um, I have a formula for, you know, I have a formula for a lot of things. 
Um, but if it's a project that is a little different because they asked for a lot of extra something or other, then I have to really think about what I want to charge. Right. So then I send them a price quote. And in the quote, I, I write um, description. And I describe what the painting or the project is. And I use all of their words that they use to describe it. So now, what I'm telling you is utter magic. Hardly anybody does this. But this is what the top people in service businesses do. Absolutely. Because then the person on the other end, when they get your email, they'll read it and whether they realize that you just wrote what they said, they, they know that you understood what they wanted. And that's half the battle. Because a lot of times when they argue about price, it's either A, they're a cheapskate, or B, they don't have trust in you. They don't, they're not 100% confident you can give them what they need. So that's why that conversation is so important because you do completely understand what they need and you demonstrate that in what you write down in your price book to them. That's right. half the battle. Right, that's pretty. So, it's, so even though they're facts and figures, there's, it's a psychological tool. Definitely. It's, right. now, there, now there's always cheapskates in the world or maybe not even cheapskates. There's people that just can't afford you. And if your price is a thousand bucks and they absolutely can't afford a thousand bucks, they can only afford 500 bucks, give them a smaller painting that's worth 500 bucks. And if they say, so let's say it's a client that they see the value, but they just don't have a thousand dollars, but they don't want that smaller painting, get creative. Don't give up on them yet. Say, how about this? How about? I charge you a thousand dollars, but I let you make payments. So you make, you give me a third up front and I let you make monthly payments for the next three or four months. You work it out with them. So this is, this is how you do your business strategies. Yes. Tell, oh, by the way, what's that book you have coming out? Thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm so excited about my book. It's called art, money and success. And I'm excited about it because even though, okay, that's my art, and so I'm a little nervous about it, I know it's really good. <laughs> oh, okay. I know it's really good because I'm sharing a lot of my secrets. My husband might divorce me over it because he, he, doesn't, he doesn't read any of my stuff. Why is that? So, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. I don't know why. He doesn't care about it. <laughs> I mean, he cares about it. He cares about me. He just doesn't care about reading about the business of art because he's reading about other, he's reading about physics and solar dynamics and stuff like that. <laughs> I gotcha. So, so he's a, he's a, he's a planetarian. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, so now that was some great insight. Oh, but, but let's go back to the book. What's how, come on. When is that going to drop? So, um, I don't have the exact date yet, but sometime the end of January. Okay. And so, to, Oh, and I'm really glad that you brought it up because anyone that's interested in my book, which I guarantee, I guarantee you, no matter where you are in your art business, unless you're already making millions, actually it still will probably help you. Um, anywhere you are, it's going to help you, whether you're beginning or you're, you're in the six figures. If you want to get on my pre-launch mailing list, or if you want to read a little more about my book, go to mariabrophy.com backslash book. And there's information about it, and you can get on my pre-launch list. And anybody on my pre-launch list is, um, every two weeks I send them a little excerpt out of the book. So okay. a little sneak peek. So, so I'm looking for that to drop, and I'm definitely going to go to 
Maria Brophy. What's that again now? Maria Brophy. Yeah. B R O P H Y. Yes. Dot com backslash book. B O O. Okay. So, you know, for the Deputy. people out there that have a difficulty hearing me or remembering your beautiful name. So, <laughs> so now here's another. It's like this is a, a sidebar question away from the book. But what is your, you know, what is your biggest challenge? What, what is your biggest concern about, you know, everyone has a thing that, oh my God, I, I can't do it because of this. What's yours? Like my biggest fear, like of something I'm afraid I can't do. Is that what you mean? Yeah, we could say that. I've struggled with public speaking most of my life. Really? Yeah, so, and I've done public speaking and I, I do it occasionally. As soon as this book hits, I already, I actually already have lectures lined up at different art centers and so forth. Um, but my dream is to get on stages with thousands of people like Tony Robbins, only it's me. Get out of here. And just, yeah, that's always been my dream, but I'm like, mm. What, 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 what you talk, what you talking about? Public speaking is scary for me. Like, what are you talking about? You, I mean, you know, you, you, you doing the thing with me here, you do the thing with the clients. I, well, you know, like, I never would think, I never would have thought that about you. I know. I know, isn't it crazy? Like people always say that, like, what are you talking about? You're the most outgoing person. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The, 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 and I have been on small stages with small audiences and I'm always like, <gasps> okay, so, so what I'm, is, I'm in the back doing, um, like trying to calm myself down. <laughs> right. Well, so is, is that tied into the confidence training you did? Yes, exactly. Exactly. It is. It totally is because I am determined to overcome that. I am determined and I never stop working towards it and okay increasing my you know what they say if you're not scared you're not growing so i keep increasing my situations where i'm nervous so in other words you get closer living onto the edge yeah so you, you you're an edge liver <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i you know i'm i'm trying to play it less safe all the time but we all have our fears right like I traveled around the world by myself out of a backpack for four months and people thought I was brave and I thought, it's no big deal, just like traveling. And you know what it is? It's a, it's a point of reference. Everything is relative. I know. And then, and then other people are doing things that I'm terrified of and they're like, what? It's no big deal. Yeah. Well, like I say, you know, I guess we all, each one has his own, his own blessing to, to make him a better person. Yeah. Let's see what else we got here in store for us today. Now this is, uh, check, what's this, man? So this is one of our new licensing deals with a company that makes beautiful Oops. water bottles and glasses. Yeah. And this is one of Drew's sacred geometry pieces that is printed on it. And I love this company. They're called My Water Gallery and they also licensed the artwork of Guy Harvey and Wyland. Oh, so, really? Okay. Yeah, and they're, it's such a great company. Um, they found us, and I, I'm grateful for that. So now, is, is this water for regular folks or just for San Clemente people? <laughs> <laughs> He's shipping them all over the country. They're, really? yeah, so, um, and it's, you, what people do with it, it makes a great gift, but you fill it up with water and keep it in your fridge. And when you have company over, you have this, you know, you're, you're serving water out of a beautiful, fancy water bottle. That, that the bottle itself is like, yeah, I gotta have the bottle. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And, and really this photo doesn't even capture it because I, I, I can actually, I have one here, I'll show you. Okay. I don't know if you can really see this. Um, am I holding, can you see it? Yeah, we can see it, it's better, it's better here with, with the image on the screen, I think. 
Okay. Is, that, is that a label is that are printed on or is that like in, in printed on, it's like a water decal printed on and it's on the inside of the bottle it so is like, really yes, and the, so the bottle has a big window and when uh -huh. you have water in it you can't tell from the photo because the photo is more flat yeah but um it, it has like a 3d effect when you're actually holding the actual bottle in your hand okay let's oh i see that okay we can see that that's nice so in other and words, so the, the artwork will always be there. Yes. Yes, I can, see the, I can see the 3D effect. That's, that's nice, beautiful. Yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? And then we have matching glasses, which I am drinking my coffee out of. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. So and this is one of your licensing yeah. deals? It's a licensing yeah. deal. This is a licensing deal where they, you know, we get paid royalties for everything that sells. Yeah. Wow. Cool, man. Yeah. That's the thing I really like about licensing deals is because I don't want to be a manufacturer. I don't want to manufacture things, but I love to see Drew's art printed on things. Yes, it's, 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 it's more cost effective that way. Yeah. And leave, leave it, you know, leave the manufacturing to the manufacturers. That's what they're good at. That's what they're, yeah. But I, I just, I saw this and said, my God, we have to see them talk about this. This is beautiful. I love this, man. Congratulations. Thank you. What else we got going on here? Oh, here we are back to the wonderful <laughs> Maria Brophy. Oh. So, you know, I, I mean, um, I like this photograph of you. It, it gives you that, that nice, uh, personable, warm, glowy look. Can I tell you a little story about that photo? Yes, please. I, I, uh, there, there's a photographer named um, Scott Smalling in South Carolina. And my husband and I were back there two years ago for a couple months. And I wanted a photo to use on my website and so forth. And <clears throat> at the time, my father-in-law was dying, and Drew and I were very sad and glum. And so when the photographer showed up, I was like, God, you gotta, you know, I gotta get in a better mood for these photos. And he is such, Scott Smolin is such a good photographer. He just, he set up his camera and he's like, well, let's just talk. And so he was asking me, what do you like about consulting? Tell me about some of the things you do with some of the artists you work with. And so I started talking and as I was talking about some of the artists that I've worked with and some of the situations, I, it brings me so much joy to work with artists that it just came through and showed oh, he got wow. all these photos. And then he said, that's great, look. And he, and he showed me and I said, I cannot believe you pulled that out of, like he literally pulled that out of you right right he's a smart man smart man yeah that's a beautiful piece i like this photograph it says a lot about you and then i have a question i mentioned before i did an interview with eric on music he's doing yeah. he's doing 40 panels you know eric i do know eric yeah he's doing, yeah. He's, doing he's doing 40 panels of dante's inferno wow i didn't know Right, and they're like, it's a three-year project, and and we have to help him out because he he wants to get it get these into a museum in the states. Oh, I love it. Well, I'll help him any way I can. What can yeah. I do? Share on Instagram, Facebook. And well, I'll, I'll tell him that that you guys should hook up, right? So yeah, yeah, definitely. I I love that. I think I I really think that artists need to band together and help each other more. If you look at you know some of the I, I'm an avid reader, and I noticed that um. A lot of authors, particularly in the self-help mode, yes. uh, genre, um, they band together and they promote each other. And I think yeah. artists need to do that too. Well, you know, there was that, that big thing about eight years ago, what was that book of The Secret, whatever it was? Yeah. Well, yeah. That was a bunch of copywriters banding together. <laughs> <laughs> to, to promote, it was all those guys, right? Yeah. That's what it was. So how do you... What would be a, a comparable thing for artists to do? Like take over the world, like the George Washington Bridge or what? What would they do? I think they just need to band together and help each other. Like um, let, let's say you set, you're sending a newsletter out to your people, maybe mention an artist in that newsletter and introduce them to your collectors and vice versa. You introduce each other's to each other's collectors. If you have like five or six artists that have um, 
maybe non-competing art, like the art shouldn't look alike, but maybe it would appeal to the same type of people, type of person. Right, right. I got you. They share each other's information, and that's what because people who collect art. They don't collect from just one artist. They like to have a variety. And why not work it out with other artists to help each other? So with that in mind, what is the mindset, in your opinion, what is the mindset of the collector? The mindset of the collective? Collector, the person who collects. Oh, the collector, sorry. Um, (laughs) No wonder why that question didn't make sense to me. well uh there's a couple different kinds of collectors there's the kind that just loves your art and they don't care if it's an original or a print or a jacle or on paper Um, and then there's the serious collector and the serious collector is one who only wants truly unique works and they're not afraid to pay for them, and they don't mind dropping 10, 20, 50 grand, depending on what it is. And that collector is going shopping on artnet.com and those online auction houses, but they're also looking for unique things that the rest of the world hasn't maybe totally discovered yet. And that type of person is never gonna buy a clay print on canvas because to them, that's crap. Um, so, you know, it's just two different, just like everybody, you know, there's so many different personalities. There's so many different types of collectors and exactly, exactly. you have to know, you know, every artist is at a different level or a different place. So you have to know who your collector is or, or who your art fits best with. Right. Exactly. I mean, I, you couldn't answer that. It's not a, you, you don't have a panacea for that. I know there's just, just one thing. So now, is there any, anything else you want to talk about before we go down the happy trails? <laughs> Gosh, there's so much to talk about. Well, go ahead, wrap on, wrap on. What you got? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd like to close with, if, if every person listening to this gets this one thing, I'd be really happy, and that is, Do what you want to do. Don't be afraid to paint something or create something because it's not accepted by the norm or you think people won't like it. If you really want to do it, do it and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and don't stop doing it until you don't want to do it anymore. Some of the best most memorable works of art were so disliked by people who everybody thought knew what was good and what wasn't good. Exactly. And those people eventually came around. And I see this all the time. Do do what you're driven to do. So you're saying just do you. Yeah, just do it. Okay. Screw so, what everybody else says. Right, right. Um, screw what your professors say. The heck with the gallery system. The heck with your spouse, whatever. Just do what it is that you're driven to do. Be like that. Be like a madman that's like, I don't care. You know, well, this is what I'm doing. Like, I picture Jackson Pollock, you know, in the beginning, people were like, what is that guy doing? And he's this madman in his garage, throwing paint everywhere. And, and you know, look at him now. I mean, because, you know, look at how he's seen now. By the right, 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 right. We, 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 we can't speak for him personally because he's in a different dimension <laughs> right now. But, right, but he's, he might be listening to us right now. I'm sure he is. <laughs> he always does, as far as I know. So, once again, how can people contact you, Maria? MariaBrophy.com. Go to my blog. There's a lot of great information on there. I put my heart and soul into everything I write. And if you want to work with me, go to my work with me page. If anything, go to my page on my website that talks about my book and please sign up to be on my book pre-launch list because you will get free insights with a lot of great information in there. 
including how to praise your artworks. That's, that's the one thing that I think a lot of people will enjoy. Okay, that's good. And so that's Maria Brophy from San Clemente, California, by the way of Maryland. And remember folks, this show, Can't Get Art with Bill Jordan is brought to you by the Academy of Composition. If you really wanna take your art to the next level, go to core80.com, talk to Don Victor, he's the man. Just like Maria, he picks them up and puts them down. So <laughs> with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank you for coming on and being here. And we're gonna say until next time,